He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 20 Orphan of the Light In the days that followed Lex Luthor being elected president, news of the previous night's sprawling coordinated prison break slowly unfolded. Dozens of the most notorious criminals that the Justice League members had ever faced were free. Of them, only the Weather Wizard and Toy Man had surfaced on election night. The rest had disappeared altogether. It wasn't just Iron Heights Penitentiary that had been freed. The three facilities holding criminal metahumans were all part of some grand operation. Iron Heights, Arkham Asylum, and Bell Reef facility containing dangerous metahumans had all been effectively emptied of their most high-profile prisoners. Meanwhile, Star Lab's warehouse had been simultaneously robbed that night. For Clark, this explained how Weather Wizard and Toy Man had gotten a hold of their equipment. Had those two not made such a spectacle of themselves, the prison break would have passed quietly in the night while the world watched the election results come in. Colonel Steve Trevor was sent by Argus to update the Justice League. It was from him that Clark learned that all of the guards from each of the facilities had been drugged, resulting in their eerie smiles. Approximately 40% of them still hadn't recovered. The drugging of the guards was not reported in the news. Clark wondered if this was something Luther was covering up. He wasn't sure if it was appropriate to suggest the future president was masterminding a mass prison break, but the others at the meeting were less shy to ask. With trepidation, Martian Manhunter brought it up. Is it possible Luther might have anything to do with it? Green Arrow had no hesitation, practically accusing Luther outright. More like, what part did he play? What are the chances he didn't have something to do with it? The Green Lantern leaned forward with a wry smile. Are you giving odds? I might be willing to take that bet. A round of chuckles lightened the mood a little. Steve Trevor was totally candid in his answer. It doesn't seem like it at this point, but it's not a question we haven't asked. If we learn anything, we'll keep you up to date. But his involvement doesn't track with what we know about Luther. None of this is to his advantage, especially having it associated with election night. Clark had not considered this. Lex's public image meant a lot to him. It wasn't likely he would tarnish it on purpose. But Luther was not beyond suspicion, especially in his rise to power. Clark decided it was time to move on to the next matter on the agenda. What about that thing that looked like me? Bizarro. Does Argus have any theories on where that came from? Colonel Trevor sat back in his chair and rubbed his chin for a moment, almost as though he were assessing his need for a shave. Slumping forward, slightly defeated, the colonel confessed. Frankly, Superman, we were hoping you could tell us. I mean, he did bear a slight resemblance to you. I wish I could, Superman confessed. Too bad. Though lucky for us, it was something the princess could handle. The princess? Diana, you know, Wonder Woman. Oh, oh yeah. It sure was nice seeing her again. She is something else. Clark had forgotten Steve Trevor had been to Themyscira. He felt a tinge of what he guessed must be envy. When the debriefing was complete and Colonel Trevor was gone, Jean Jones was contacted telepathically with a message for Clark. It was from Batman. The Martian Manhunter touched two fingers to Superman's temple, allowing Batman to speak directly into his mind. Clark, we need to talk. Bruce? It was such a vivid experience, Clark couldn't help but look around for Batman, speaking out loud in response. The Arrow and Green Lantern stopped what they were doing, looking up at Superman with some mild curiosity. The voice of Batman answered inside of Clark's head. Come to the Batcave. I'm ready to tell you the truth. Clark had his doubts. He voiced them telepathically. Are you really? John Jones will come with you. He can tell you everything. Superman and John Jones excused themselves and went straight to Gotham. At the Batcave, Bruce awaited. This time he was not wearing his cape cowl and super suit. Instead he was wearing a wrinkled business attire, only more worn than usual. He was unshaven and looked as though it had been a while since he'd slept. 
Are you all right, Bruce? I know who freed the prisoners. Startled, Clark took a step back. What? Who was it? Jean put a hand on Superman's shoulder. He could already sense what Batman wanted to explain. It's not that simple. He wants to tell you. But knowing who it was won't be enough. He needs you to understand. Understand what? Hunched over in his seat, Bruce looked up to Clark from under his brow. It's about Krypton. What happened before and after we destroyed the planet. These words, once again, made Clark wince. Hearing them spoken out loud was akin to the familiar pain of kryptonite. John Jones felt Superman's fatigue and reached out with his mind to support him. Clark fought to keep his focus. He needed to hear this. The Martian Manhunter understood how Bruce intended him to help them. I can merge your minds in telepathic communication if you are willing. You will be able to experience his memories. Do I have your permission? Clark took a breath. He almost feared what he might learn this way. Okay. I'll do it. How do we start? Take each other's hand. I will do the rest. Bruce didn't hesitate to offer his hand, looking Clark straight in the eye. As they met halfway, embracing palm to palm, Jean Jones stood in between them, wrapping his hands around their own. The room around them seemed to dissolve as Bruce began showing them how he was raised, his education, and his training. Children of the Light Keepers were disciplined from a very young age. Minds like Bruce Wayne and Lex Luthor were created with intention. Educated by private tutors, Bruce's primary teacher was the renowned robotics professor, Arthur Ivo. Ivo was a cold man. Under his supervision, the boy developed a calculating mind with machine-like precision. Bruce was among the youngest of his generation. Along with his training, he received the most advanced genetic enhancements available at the time of his conception. He had never been directly a part of the planning of Krypton's destruction. His parents thought of him as insurance, in case their plan to destroy the massive planet happened to fail. For a long time, they had their doubts, though Bruce had not always been aware of how deep these doubts ran. In the year before Krypton would return, Bruce's parents were shot and killed in front of him. He was only eight years old at the time. The grief consumed him, yet he would not let himself show it. Instead, his upbringing and training had prepared him with the ability to begin his own investigation into his parents' murders. On the surface of the crime, it appeared as a mugging. Bruce had been there and witnessed their murders. That night, he swore vengeance against crime itself. It was the naive promise of an eight-year-old lacking the discernment to grasp the complexity of the situation. At nine years old, he understood this. The shooter took his father's wallet, but left his watch and his mother's ring. This was no mere robbery. Bruce determined that his parents had been killed by either one or more of the families within the Light Keepers, or by one of the strange associates they dealt with in secret. There was an underworld in Gotham, and Bruce's parents were somehow connected to it. The more he studied, the more he learned of Gotham's corrupt nature. The city was wholly willing to accept the story that his parents were killed by a mugger, but Bruce knew better. His list of primary suspects centered around six families within the Light Keepers. Yet in the months after Krypton's destruction, each of these families were killed off in freak accidents. Lex Luthor, along with Bruce, was the only other child to survive these killings. He was not in the car with his parents when they were killed in an accident. Lex's convenient absence from the car wreck made him Bruce's first suspect. Thoroughly investigating Luther, Bruce learned enough to conclude that at the age of 14, Lex did not plan the death of half a dozen elite families including his own parents. Though he showed no grief for his mother and father, and very much avoided his parents' company when he heard that other Lightkeeper families were being assassinated, he wasn't the killer. No evidence pointed to anything more sinister than Luther's indifference. By the time Bruce was 11, he was learning how Gotham's underworld was controlled by a clandestine organization known as the League of Shadows. He set out to infiltrate this elite organization and embed himself into the bottom rungs of organized crime. For nearly two years, he floated around the world working undercover as a master pickpocket. Eventually, at the age of 13, in his pursuit of the League of Shadows, he found himself in South Pacific Asia, infiltrating an elite gala as a busboy. His informant assured him that this gala event was congregated by more than just the rich and politically connected. Elite members of the underworld were said to be attending, but from what Bruce saw, the guest list was nothing exceptional. It was an average high society mixer 
until a large entourage entered the party. At its center moved a regal man of conspicuous interest. He appeared to have stepped out of another time and from another world. His facial features were sharp. Dark hair swept dramatically upward. Sideburns ran down his jaw, streaked with silver from his temples. His eyebrows were unusually long, and his only other facial hair was a thin mustache, starting at his outer lip and melding into a two-horned goatee. Bruce eavesdropped on the surrounding guests of the gala and soon determined that no one in the room was without fear of this man. Most of them had no clue who he was, yet those who did were too afraid to speak his name. They only dared look his way through the corners of their eyes. The man traveled with an extensive entourage, including an exceptionally well-armed security detail. Slowly maneuvering through the group serving various platters of hors d'oeuvres, Bruce managed to work his way close to the man at the center. The man's bodyguards would not allow Bruce to serve him directly, but once nearby, Bruce made a startling discovery. This mysterious party guest wore an ancient wristband that Bruce was all too familiar with. It was a singularly unique artifact that had belonged to his father. He had seen it many times in his youth, though not since his parents' death. Bruce was determined to follow this man home, retrieve his father's wristband, and learn who this villain was. Slipping out of the servant's entrance of the banquet hall's kitchen, he quickly located a pack of heavily armed vehicles outside of the gala. Lightly guarded, Bruce was able to slip under one of the military trucks. He lashed himself to the underside of its bed and waited until the armed entourage left the party to return home. Stowing away undetected, he slipped through the perimeter walls of a vast jungle citadel, replete with sentinel towers. In the hours between night and morning, Bruce emerged from under the truck and hid in the nearby trees. He kept a utility pack on him, containing binoculars along with other useful items. From his tree perch, Bruce surveyed the manor and observed the comings and goings of the day. As the sun rose, the servants stirred throughout the castle, revealing themselves by the scattered lights they turned on and off as they moved from here and there. From watching the movements of the staff, Bruce was able to discern the location of the master bedroom, where its balcony looked out on the estate's plentiful garden. The mysterious master of the house never emerged from it, though glimpses of him could be seen as he moved throughout the building. Bruce found tracking the man was as simple as noticing where his staff congregated. They preemptively followed his every move, preparing and securing each space for their employer before he entered. As the master of the estate returned to his quarters, late in the evening, the house slowly unwound behind him as the staff shut each light off once again. Under the cover of the crescent moon's pale light, Bruce slipped into the back door of the kitchen and procured himself a small supply of food. He slept most of the next day, further away from the manor, in a different tree with more support to rest himself. As the sun began to set that day, the staff bustled to prepare for their master's departure. The entourage with its security detail drove out of the grounds in a grand procession. When night fell, the manor remained dark, except for the prep cooks in the kitchen. This was his chance. Bruce came out of his hiding place and made his way to the garden. From inside of his utility pack, he withdrew a coiled rope, bearing a small grappling hook at one end. Securing it to the balcony, Bruce flitted up the rope to the second story and perched for a moment on the banister's edge. He assessed the room ahead of him. Inside, it was not the bedroom chambers he had expected. It looked like a museum of sorts. Along the walls and throughout the room was an array of artifacts, suits of armor, cabinets of oddities, an assortment of curious jewelry, and an arsenal of handheld weapons. At its center was a spiral staircase. Bruce hopped down from his perch and slowly entered the room to investigate. The objects were even more curious upon closer inspection. There was an otherworldly allure to it all, as though a great mystery was held there. Bruce didn't have to look long before he came upon his father's wristband. As unusual as he had always thought the piece to be, it seemed at home among these ancient artifacts. Standing before it, he reached his hand out and paused. It was as though he were standing on the threshold of claiming his birthright, when the silence was broken by the sound of footsteps above. Someone had been upstairs and was descending the spiral staircase. Bruce took cover under a massive table adorned with exotic stones. From his vantage point, he could see a pair of feet as they reached the bottom of the stairs and made their way to the balcony. But instead of stepping outside, they stopped at the precipice and quietly stood. Breaking the silence, the man began speaking, seemingly to himself. It is a shame when the staff leaves the windows open in the evening. Young bats and little birds find their way inside at night. He began closing the balcony doors. 
the poor things do not realize the complexity of that predicament. With the doors shut, he began circling around the outer perimeter of the room. In their lack of mental maturity, they succumb to their fears. The man's feet stopped, facing the bracelet on the wall, opposite to the table Bruce hid under. Bruce's heart pounded in his chest, loud enough, he thought, to give himself away altogether. The poor creature panics, and more often than not, it will kill itself in its attempt to escape. The feet turned around and stepped toward the table. What about you, little bird? Are you ready to learn how to fly in the dark? Come out now, and we can skip the worst of this. Bruce hesitated a moment before realizing how much of a trap this had been all along. He crawled out from under the heavy table. As he rose, he slowly drew out his pocket knife. Standing up, he held it out in defiance between himself and the mysterious man. But this figure before him was not who Bruce had feared it would be. This was not the master of the estate. Instead, it was something far more terrifying. Towering over the boy was the caped visage of a monster. Spiraling horns rose from his head, his face only partially human. The beast scrutinized Bruce with a hard, strenuous stare, sizing him up. Excellent. You learn quickly. Very good. He turned away and began perusing the room, seemingly unconcerned with Bruce's knife. You have nothing to fear, young Master Wayne. I have sent my people away so that I could lure you out of hiding. At the gala, I suspected I had seen you working among the service. Bruce was mystified. Was this the same man he had seen before? An elaborate mask assisted by fear and imagination seemed to distort his perception. Bruce strained to see this man under his disguise. Unperturbed, the man went about examining his own collection. I cannot tell you how much you have exceeded my expectations. Since arriving on our grounds, only my chef could detect any trace of you. He is very particular about measuring rations. Bruce didn't understand where this man was going with his flattery and attempted to take control of the situation by speaking up. Who are you? The man stopped and squinted at Bruce, measuring his potential once again. Yes, very good. A student without questions is a student unwilling to learn. Bruce stood frightened to his core. This masked man seemed larger than life. Even so, he stood his ground and demanded answers, lifting his extended arm higher and pointing his knife outward. I asked, who are you? Yes, and conversely, if the question is not asked, no one cares for the answer. So, to answer the question you are indeed asking, Mr. Wayne, I have been known by many names, most of which no longer have any meaning. I am the demon's head, Ra's al Ghul. Though to answer your deeper question, the one you are too afraid to ask, I was a friend of your father and your mother. The man proceeded to reach up and unfasten his mask, removing it to reveal the entirety of his face. I must apologize to you in particular, Bruce Wayne, for I fear that it was through their association with myself that your parents' lives were taken from you. He looked down at Bruce with a mixed expression of grief and pity. His firm yet compassionate eyes held the boy, securing him as an anchor, just as his world began careening. This unexpected revelation washed over Bruce. He relaxed his outstretched arm, and it fell to his side. More than anything else, Bruce wanted answers. It seemed here he had found them. Methodically, he closed his weapon and returned it to his pocket. All right, I'm listening. Ras al Ghul pounced on Bruce, swiftly gliding across the floor toward him, coming to a halt less than a meter from the boy. Bruce almost stumbled back as the ancient man stared him down. How well you listen will soon be determined. Walk with me, little bird. Let me lead you through my estates. I have much to teach you, as long as you are willing to learn. They toured the grounds by lantern as Ras al Ghul introduced the boy to every facet of his clandestine operation. That night, Bruce Wayne began his apprenticeship under the demon's head.
Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Sign of L is written and produced by myself. If you're enjoying this audiobook, I hope you're recommending it to friends. If you haven't rated and reviewed the show yet, it really helps, and there's really nothing quite like validation. As much as I like validation, support goes a lot further. Become a patron at patreon.com slash bluefoot to ensure I keep writing. I really can't thank you enough. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC comics and characters, originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by John Brew, Carmine Infantino, Don Cameron, Ed Debratka, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peter, Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, Mort Weisinger, George Papp, Gil Kane, Otto Binder, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams, and Julius Schwartz. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by David Hillowitz, Blue Dot Sessions, Crowinder, Masato Abe, Bio Unit, Elitrolice, Poddington Bear, Igor Kabarov, and Sergei Quadrado. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. Share your feelings in these low-key games. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 21, The Demon's Apprentice.